Welcome to Bad Dog Agility, a podcast helping you reach all of your dog agility goals. Whether it's competing under the bright lights of the televised finals at Westminster or successfully navigating a homemade course in your own backyard, we'll bring you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts with your hosts, Jennifer, Esteban, and Sarah. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah, and this is episode 325. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitaboard.com and the new Teeter Teach It, an easy-to-use tool that controls the amount of tip on your teeter so you can introduce motion to your dog in a gradual way. Go to hitaboard.com for the new Teeter Teach It and other training tools and toys. Use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hitaboard.com. Today, we're going to talk about the upcoming inaugural UKI North American Invitational, and we are joined by the CEO and co-founder of UKI, Greg Derrett. Welcome back to the podcast, Greg. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me back. Good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this inaugural implies the first, and it implies the first of more than one. So we wanted to bring you onto the podcast to talk about this event and kind of what it is and who it's geared towards and what the, you know, the purpose is, how it works, all those uh, nitty gritty details. Mm -hmm. And we love to go straight to the source. So let's just start with, um, you know, Greg, uh, you've got a new event. UKI has a new event. Tell us about it. Okay, so um, I guess the the idea behind it was um, several factors coming together. Uh, the, the first one is we've now got the US Open on the East Coast, West Coast on the West Coast, um, and then the Canadian Open, um, obviously in Canada, up north. And it was looking for a, a more central location for a new big event, uh, sort of a demand from people to use a different location, not just the two coasts, because everyone was having to travel long way to each coast obviously so there was that kind of feedback we were getting but also because we had the three opens it was kind of looking for an event to bring the three together um so almost like a super event if you want to call it that where the champions from the three events come together and and fight it out to be the best also one thing that i've always wanted to do is, is um run an astroturf um, um event event um over in europe now that's getting really popular um, services have got so much better recent years in AstroTurf. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'm calling it AstroTurf. You guys call it, don't call it, you just call it Turf, I think, don't you? It, well, um, it's kind of funny that you say that because <laughs> I believe, I could be lying, but I'm pretty sure, and Esteban may know this too, I believe it's called AstroTurf because it was created for the Astrodome, which is in Houston, which is where we're recording from oh, right now. And it's like oh, Kleenex. Everybody just started calling it AstroTurf because of that. But yes, Turf. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got Astro in, in, in Europe, but um, yeah, I know in America it's maybe like on turf and natural turf, and so it's like different definition. But yeah, it was um, so th- that was one of the one of the thoughts to run a, an event um, on that surface would be different. Um, the West Coast is on grass, the US Open is on dirt mainly, um, so it was a different, you know, another al- alternative um, kind of a um, structure to the event with different surface, different location. Um, a slightly different format with the Invitational, um, but really trying to bring everyone together and also feed it through to the WO. So um, we've got a win on spot there um, at the Invitational for the, the following year's WO, um, where people could either use that win on spot to represent their country as an additional person for their country, or they could um, use it as a wild card and just be there as an individual. So um, it's down to that individual that wins it. So it's kind of feeding it all through together, joining everything up, uh, bringing the W into it and then all feeding back together. So, yeah, that was the initial idea. And then the qualification of it was trying to um, reward those that have, have done well at the, the three opens um, so that we're um, trying to bring the best of the best together. Um, it's a long-term goal of the event so that the best in North America come together. Um, and we then threw in um, ability for 50 people living outside of North America um, could apply to come. That's sort of just a, a throw out to see whether there was any demand for that. But also, you know, some of the big seminar presenters traveling around maybe in March, April would be in the country. So um, we'd bring another level of, of um, quality to the event, um, if you want to call it that. 
Excellent. All right. I have a couple of questions right off the bat. Um, mm-hmm. Well, and, and a couple of things that I just want to throw out there for our listeners who may not be as familiar with um, UKI or with the US Open. So the the uh, West Coast Open, we have a podcast on that. So I will, I will link to that um, as well, because that's a relatively new event. Um, and the US Open and the Canadian Open as the name implies, those are open events. So anybody can go and compete in them. And so I think that's one of the things that really um, sets this apart is that anybody can go to the open, which is really exciting for people, especially people like I think of a lot of advanced competitors who have a lot of um, personal skills and have brought along a lot of dogs and they don't have to kind of wade through all of the opening classes with their young dog who who may be extremely skilled. They can just go straight into the open. Um, but this event is is not that. It's not, you, you know, you have to, it's an invite event. Um, so there's a, a big dichotomy there. And then I guess one question that I had when you said, that you wanted to do something central and on turf. So is that for this year or is your thought that it is going to continue to be at this location like year after year after year? Uh, We've got a two-year deal with the venue, so we're definitely there for 24 and 25, but it's a brand new idea. And, you know, it's um, my experience with running events, year one and year two, a massive learning potential. And um, where we go with it from 26 I don't know at this point. Um, right. I, I did. I, I did. I would like to keep it on an astro turf, so it is a different. It is a different surface, so that we, we, you know, we're catering for whatever your preference for surface. We've got an open event for you, kind of idea, um, or a big event for you, I should say, more than open event. Um, so yeah, it's definitely there for two years. We'll be looking at feedback, looking at you know what people think. Um, the sign up for this year is is we've got more dogs than we can cater for. So um, we'll definitely be able to reduce it down with the lottery. And then obviously so seeing what the feedback is after this year will be be quite a tell, I think, to, to how we structure following years. So 25 will be the same venue, but whether we keep exactly the same format, the same qualifications, that's really up in the air. Just, just you know, um, analyse what happens um by the end of by mid April, I guess, once it's all all the qualific- qualific- qualifications have happened and also the events run itself. Um so yeah, that's that's a bit of an open ended answer that one, isn't it? It's uh basically um next year we've got a venue booked, but that's about as much as we've got for this. All right. This point. A name and a venue. <laughs> right. Well let me let me summarize the timeline then for myself. So you have the West Coast event, you've got the US Open on the East Coast, then you have uh, the Canadian event. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all of these take place uh, before the new year, right? So the season kind of starts yes. in the fall and winter. And then, yeah, that was one of the ideas with this as well. Is they, they all happen um, Canadian Open and the West Coast are in September, and the US Open is it named mid November, but was early November. Um, we've had a change of date of that because of the venue. Um, it's, a fair come into the the venue two weeks before, so we moved back a, a week or so. And um, but the idea with this as well is to do it at a different time of year. Um, we didn't want a big event in the middle of a season. We kind of want the big events at the start of the finish. Um, so that was one of the reasons for sort of March April time was to just as the season's going. Um, and also one of the ideas with it is that the US and Canadian team got a nice big event to go to before they would go to WO. So um, that was another idea for this. It's a sort of five, six weeks before they're going to be traveling. They get to run on some of the top judges in the world on, on courses that are going to be very appropriate to to what they're going to face at the world. So it should also hopefully help the, um, the two national teams um, just before they travel. Mm, got it. That was going to be my next question. How, how How's the timing compared to WAO? So you're saying there's about a five or six week. Uh, yeah, it's about six week builder before. So. It should, so for me, um, from my own experience competing internationally, it's a nice, you got six weeks, anything goes wrong, you've got a little bit of time to fix it, but also you can find out where you are, you know, within three or four weeks before you actually need to start tapering down and, and getting ready to travel. So um, that was some of the idea behind that date as well, is definitely to 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 allow world, two world teams to be um, prepped, so gotcha. to speak, and also get together and maybe compete together um, at a big event. Gotcha. Well, let me ask also about the timing um, relative to Crufts, because I know that there's not a lot of competitor overlap, if any at all. 
but um, I know that uh, you're like a, a an annual fixture at Crufts. I can't imagine Crufts happening without you being there. So how wh- where's the timing for that? It's pretty close, yeah. right? Yeah, I got about um, I got about three weeks between. So uh, not, not okay. too bad, not too bad. Um, it's okay. uh, Crufts is always the second Sunday in March, mm-hmm. so we're we're about three weekends later. So yeah, not not it's it's pretty good for me. Um, yeah, I mean that's obviously also when we're running events. That's always one of the, the other things we have to look at is what international events are there, what events right. are we also at, you know, and um, and try not to clash too much. But it's it's getting more and more difficult now in the world not to clash with something. I mean that is the huge problem with agility worldwide now is it's opened up. It's it's there are events everywhere and every weekend there are big events, you know, in different opens, especially in Europe now. There's a lot more of these open events that are happening. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a complicated weekend selection nowadays, that's for sure. Right, right. And I think you bring up a very good point that I wanted to talk about a little bit here. Um, you know, it's both a good and possibly a, a bad thing that agility, uh, number one, continues to grow, right? So I think that's, that's great. Uh, number two, continues to have multiple offerings, right? Different venues, different organizations that gives people uh, more opportunities to show up on a given weekend and compete, you know, something that'll fit their schedule a little better or their personal um, uh, likes better as far as like what kind of courses they're getting, you know, what kind of training they need to engage in to qualify for those events. But, um, uh, oh, and it's good that the the, the different organizations are pushing each other, right? I, I think back to like um, how we all got rid of the shoot that happened like a, in a week. <laughs> in a, it was a domino effect and it just went bang, yeah. bang, bang, bang. Right. And I don't think that happens necessarily if the entire agility world is just one organization, right. Or two organizations. Mm-hmm. But I think when you have this very healthy competition between organizations and you're, you're competing literally for competitors to show up at your, at your events, um, I think that can be a very healthy and good thing. Okay. And now we get to the, maybe the, the con part. There are so many things. How is somebody supposed, uh, how is somebody supposed to choose? Oh, and- I have an answer. Okay. Go ahead. You, you- don't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, like you, you, or, or actually you do, you do choose. Like, I think, uh, we, we have another podcast that I'll put a link to. That's one of my favorites that we ever did called choose your own agility adventure. And the idea is that, you know, everybody chooses their own path, chooses the things they care about, chooses the events that they want to be at. And you have to get away from the 20 year old mentality of I can go to all the big things. I, you know, I can mm-hmm. take, you know, four big trips a year and I can go to all the big things. You cannot go to all the big things. And you, you have like, everybody has to become okay with that. And I know that there are people that really struggle with missing something. And then when they right. see everybody else go, they, you know, they're like, ah, oh, maybe I should have taken vacation and gone to that one. But you just have to realize that you literally cannot do everything. Right. And the person that you see that went, they're skipping something else to go. And so, you know, I think it's just a, a change in mindset that the whole entire um, community has to go through, especially people that have had a history of going to, you know, you know, nationals every year for the last 20 years, you know, and now they may have to choose between this national or that national or nationals or an international event that they want to do or something like that. Right, right. That's interesting. Well, I'll have to I agree. That. Definitely yeah. nowadays. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just so much. I mean, just you know, obviously in North America is more organizations, but in Europe now we're we're getting a lot of um sort of big open events that are unaffiliated almost and they're not they're not really they're, they're following kind of similar rules um but they're kind of not really licensed by an, an organization even so um they're getting quite popular as well so last weekend was gold rush in germany for example which is mm. is literally um it's, it's not affiliated to any organization but it's, it's what those guys want to do so um course difficulty and all that stuff is is there that the organizers of choice um so there's there's so much more variety coming in and i think it's it is down to people now is I think we found with UKI um, post COVID that people are far more, I want to do the agility I want to do. And that's, that's kind of where they're going now. They're, they're getting out of their old habits of this is what I've always done. They're actually saying, actually, what do I want to do? And it's something that we've noticed 
quite a lot of people talking to us is just like this is the type of agility we want and that's what we've decided now we're going to do and we're not going to do xyz that we used to do so right um, yeah, i think it's an interesting change of attitude that covid has caused because of you know i think people lost two years and they don't want to lose any more time so they're now going to focus on actually the agility they want um and it's down to us as organizations i guess to put on the agility that we think they want and, and hopefully hit it on the head um, if we can Right. Absolutely. And we're going to get back to the invitational in a minute because okay. I still have some questions there, but you've taken us directly to um, another question that I had for the podcast. Um, so you talked about how these open events in Europe have become very popular. Well, I would say that there's an open event in America that has become very popular too, <laughs> and that's the U.S. Open. So we just had the U.S. Open and um, the the Estevam was there commentating on on all of the final events and just the size and scope and number of runs, but also number of individual dogs has grown so much in the you know the past four or five years and just yeah. kind of back of the envelope like I'm looking at it as the second biggest national event in the United States uh, you know I believe that that is true behind the AKC Nationals and not behind by much so can you tell us a little bit about the growth of UKI um especially in the last couple of years and and the growth of the the open event the US Open as a national level event that's attracting you know all of the best competitors yeah, I think, um, I th- you know, just referring back to what I said a minute ago with, with COVID, that's something that we certainly found is that people have come out of COVID and they've decided they want UKI style of agility more. Um, um, obviously, you know, behind the organization, this is the type of agility we think it, 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 the way agility is going and the way that we're steering it uh, with UKIs um, is, is similar to what's happening in Europe. Um, challenges are slightly less still in, in North America, if I'm being honest. Uh, you know, I think the some of the level of courses we're seeing in Europe um, is a, is another another level. It's you know some of the courses that we're currently seeing are, are just just a brand new level of difficulty that we haven't seen before. Um, but yeah, that, I think since COVID, we, we've definitely grown in all aspects of UKI from the home trials that we started uh, to get through COVID and help people and um, keep business afloat through COVID. Those are still. Proven ext- um, extremely popular. They're running every two weeks. Uh, they keep growing. Um, the number of trials, normal trials, we've got has, has grown again. Um, classics and festivals and cups. We've got great demand for those from um, trial managers more than more than we cope with. So we added the festivals to try and help with with that idea. Um, and yeah, the US Open just we keep thinking we've we've hit a maximum, and then the next year we grow another ten percent. We just keep growing with ten percent every year, which is which is lovely. Um, it's it's great to see that people are loving the US Open. It's it's not the easiest event to run now because it's it's so many runs to try and get in in, in the number of days and, and number of rings and and make that manageable. Um, but yeah, I think we're nearly eleven hundred dogs this year, um, which is a, a a long way from where we started in twenty twelve, where we had about twenty five dogs. So it's a, a massive growth in the ten years. Um, um, I think well, I think that. that it's a it's an event that both Laura and I love, so it's something we're both passionate about. The event we we think it's you know it's it's I would call it our baby, but it's kind of you know it's that event that we've really put a lot into and a lot of thought into. Um, we're constantly trying to make it better. We're constantly trying to keep it fresh with new ideas. So we brought a team in last year, for example, um, was a new idea which people can either opt into or, or they don't have to. So it was it was bringing. Team was a very love hate thing. Lots of people wanted it, but lots of people didn't want it. So we brought in the idea of, you know, you, you can do your normal runs, but they count towards a team. If you want to be in a team, they get you into a team final. So those that hate team doesn't affect them at all. Those that love team, they've now got a team event. So we're always trying to, you know, we, we're trying to keep it fresh and look at how we progress. Uh, next year, we're going to try and get all six rings indoors um, so that we can get away from the November weather, which sometimes is beautiful and in other times, the rain is it's coming into Florida. So, yeah, we're trying to do undercover next year to make it another step forward. Um, we're working on logistics of that at the moment to try and make it work um, whilst keeping the what the US Open is about, which is the, the you know the 140-foot rings and um, keeping the courses in, in the style that we want the style to be for, for the event. Yeah, as Sarah mentioned, I, I did have the privilege of providing the commentary for the Four-Legged Flicks uh, live stream 
at the U.S. Open this year, uh, along with Kama Ruschenberg. And so Kama and I were able to see, um, well, Kama competed in the event. So I did not compete in, in the event. So she was there for all the preliminary rounds. And then for the evening finals. So the event ran from, I think, Wednesday through Sunday. Is that right? Wednesday through mm-hmm. Sunday. And then yeah. Thursday through Sunday at, at the end of the day. So Sunday was more, you know, late afternoon. But um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, there was uh, like a featured event, right? Uh, whether it was a team or uh, the the biathlon agility round, right? So there would be something that we were providing commentary on for for several hours that night, and we got to see all the best teams running. And so, one, the competition level is really high. You have a lot of the top handlers here in the United States coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the Jessica Jus, the Perry Dewitts, all uh, showing up uh, with their dogs. Um, and in talking with competitors, there were several things and i think greg has hit on uh some of them here that people really like about uh uki in general but the us open specifically and a big one is um the responsiveness of of the organization right and uh i remember your tagline very early i guess this would be about 10 years ago you know it's an organization for the competitors you know by the competitors Right. As opposed to like this big monolithic, you know, kennel club or um, an organization maybe that also is uh, uh, focused on uh, the registration of dogs or confirmation. Other dog sports aside from agility rather than being an agility only type yeah. sport. So I think that's uh, one thing there. And and you had already uh, you, you just mentioned that you're going to try and move everything indoors because one of the, uh, one of the few complaints that I heard this year about the event, I guess there was a field, one of the fields out there there, you know, it, it's Florida at this time of year. So the weather's a little bit spotty. And so they had some rain and, you know, competitors are always talking about, um, uh, footing and, and, and weather conditions. And so for these finals, it's indoors covered on dirt, beautiful dirt, and they reworked the dirt like um uh, like constantly right when they break down the course they're bringing in the these huge machines and leveling everything again and then and then rebuilding the course so uh i feel like the uh the conditions are are really really good from what i saw for both uh, the human um and the dog but you're constantly uh i i guess uh responding to input from the competitors right yeah i mean yeah i guess that's key i mean that's any business really if you're not listening to your your clients and what they're telling you you're not going to survive in the market so um you know it's it's and the other i think the other thing is the big thing the 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 way we look at uki as a whole basically is you know we're competitors and what would we what 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 we want as a competitor what would i want what do i want this organization to do if i was the person running the dog um and and this year i mean Sadly, the grass in the, in the Florida venue, the outdoor natural turf, it was it was beautiful before COVID. It was our best rings. The outdoor rings were, it was this lovely grass that the dogs worked mm. brilliantly on. Um, but now we've moved two weeks later, the weather's not as good. And, and unfortunately, the, the condition of the grass has also deteriorated a lot uh, over the last two years. So, you know, that was definitely of this year. As I looked at it, it was like, well, that's, it's not given an even playing field for those guys that were running in the dry at 10 o'clock. And then it was raining hard at three o'clock and they're competing against mm-hmm. each other. It's it's not an even playing field now. So that's something that, you know, as a competitor, I would have been, I can see why they're annoyed. You know, it's it's, it's part of sport is that, the, the you know, the environment gets involved, but also if there's something that we can do to negate that in future, then um, I think we should try. So that that is that is our next big step for next year is to try to eliminate the weather as a as a factor uh to competitors so they're all on the same playing field as much as we can get them again mm-hmm. one of the big uh things that i hear heard from competitors that they love so much about the us open was that the courses were challenging so there were a lot of first-time competitors there who mm-hmm. had never competed at the us open um, but they are uh regulars at the other big uh, national events whether by uh, usdaa or the american kennel club they've been to those uh, big events and the courses are so much bigger than they're used to. We're looking at like mm-hmm. 250 yards. The course design is uh, uh, much more international, right? At least uh, mm-hmm. for the finals. 
and um, they really enjoy uh, being challenged. So I think they liked showing up and it was something a, a little bit different, a little bit new, but it was still agility. And then they were like, hey, you know, yes, I, I struggled on some of these courses. Uh, yes, they weren't all uh, perfect for me, but they like that because there's some sense mm-hmm. of, um, well, we kind of we we kind of know the drill. We know how it runs in these or other organizations. We kind of have it figured out. And I think people there's a, a large group of people amongst agility competitors that really like um, challenges. And so I think the U.S. Open was very uh, attractive to them. You know, the the everyone that I talked to, they're they're definitely going to come back if they're able to and and compete again um, next year. Um, yeah. Having said that, there there is one thing though. And um, I, I heard this from several different people. There was a split between large dog people and small dog people as to uh, yardage and like size of course, because essentially, um, and and I and I saw this as as the as a commentator for the live stream. You would see these courses, very very well designed courses, in my opinion. And there would be one set of challenges for the small dogs. You would start small and then go tall, right? And then as you work your way up in the heights, those challenges kind of went away. They weren't challenging for the big dogs, but then suddenly new challenges would open up. So that, I thought that was kind of a genius in design. But e- even even have, even have given that, there were small dog people in particular who were like, hey, that's a lot of yardage for our small dogs, for dogs running in the four inch, the eight inch. And maybe we need courses that are maybe just a little bit shorter. Like don't insult us, don't make it easy. But maybe something a little different from the large dogs. Is that a possibility? Is that something that you can be headed for? It or or are the logistics of such a big event simply uh, too too tight, too demanding to to accommodate that? Yeah, I mean that's it's, it's one of the ideas we've been throwing around, and I'm not sure we're going to try it just yet. But it is an idea in the head about can a can a judge design a course where there's two sets of numbers on it. Uh, and then we can, you know, and it might not, maybe all the obstacles aren't used between the two. So there's some obstacles come in and out so that you can keep the, you know, that the, we're already working a pretty long schedule. Um, at US Open, the, 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 the crew that are working the event, we, we were in the arenas at half four in the morning and we're, we're kind of getting out at 11 o'clock yeah. at night. So we're doing sort of 20 hour days on in the arenas anyway. Um, so we're kind of at a maximum time with that. So we, if we are to look at different courses, it needs to be in a way that we don't add time to the event just because there isn't time um, right. on that one. Um, so there is that idea. That, I mean, certainly this year um, we brought in a couple of judges that um, people, you know, we, we try and bring in judges that people are calling for. Um, so uh, you know, this year, Thomas Trey came came in from, from Hungary for us. He's probably, if not the best judge, one of the top five Mm-hmm. best judges in the world or his reputation is that it's and your opinion on on what makes a great judge but you know i certainly think he's one of the one of the best judges we've got in the world um but his, his course design is is challenging but it's it's also big so people you know people called for tamas we brought in tamas and tamas built big courses um, <laughs> you give him some but, space he's gonna run with yeah <laughs> it was also you know you kind of wanted to say to people where well, you wanted tamas now you've had tamas do you want him again sort of thing so <laughs> Um, and I think some do, and, and there are other people that maybe felt the courses this year got a little bit too big. Um, so that is certainly something that we are um, looking at and discussing with the judges, and 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 maybe trying to have a little bit of um, variation. I think a lot of our courses this year were all technically tough as well as big, and so maybe we need to over the whole event is looking at well that particular class maybe just be a little bit tighter and that particular class maybe a bit harder and you know for example make the masters mm-hmm. difficult international level but make the we've, we've just got a one standoff agility class which is just kind of like a warm-up run or maybe that should be more of a feel good if you want to call it a feel good kind of of course mm-hmm. so that, that we're discussing those kind of things about whether we should be maybe saying to specific judges this class this is what we want we want it a little bit easier we want this one a little bit harder this one you've got the space um, probably because we're going to bring the six rings indoors next year for the classes throughout the day, they're all going to be squished a little bit. Uh, you know, those, those those ring sizes are coming down from a 140 foot square to a 140 by 90. So it's going to change the shape for those. Um, 
But the important thing for me is that we've still got that variety. We've got the evening events where we can then go back to one big ring for the evening. So again, whatever your preference, you're going to be challenged in different ways. You know, in the days, they might be slightly different. Just with a long, thin course, you're going to get a different type of course designed to a big square course. You know, and that's one of the big differences with the FCI agency, for example. They're always long, thin um, arenas that they run in. So you get a very different style of course to the um, Great Britain and probably North America, which traditionally we have a square um, mm-hmm. ring. So um, I think... I think by what we're doing with Green Indoors, we're going to bring in a bit more variety um, to our course design, which I also think helps them make sure everyone's tested. You can't just be good at big. You've got to be good at technical, and you can't right. just be good at technical. You've got So we're actually going to be testing the dogs and handlers on a variety of more skills, I think, next year. Um, obviously, that's going to play out, and we'll see. But that's my initial thought is what we're doing is not only to sort the weather out, but it might also solve a couple of the other little little gripes that we had about distance has got too big and we can maybe discuss that with judges as well um course design is such a difficult one when you're talking about an event it's, it's how much do you get involved with the judge how mm, much do you sure. control them how much do you give them free reign mm-hmm. especially some of the international judges that you know they're not they're not in american agility so they come in once or twice a year um design something and disappear so they don't see the standard week in week out so that's right. also difficult whether you you know you get involved but then people want these international judges because of the designs that they see on facebook mm-hmm. um, right. so you also Absolutely. you don't want to you don't want to control them too much so it's it's always such a difficult balance and um i think some courses we got right this year and a couple of courses possibly got a little bit too technical um, um and people struggled you know the round rate got really low on a couple or sort of under five percent so that's that's probably something we, we want to be just a bit above five percent clear round ratio because it's not getting a competition nearly, um, especially with accumulative runs where you've got two together. Mm, um, yeah, you know, yeah. Double, that's a good you know, point. You want, you want a double clear on, on the first place podium. You don't want a you know somebody that's had a fault. So um, it's a it's such a difficult balance. But you also want to progress North American agility. You don't want to control the exactly. Judges so that, I was just yeah, going to say that it's yeah. people are going to get better. They're going to have gotten yeah. destroyed yeah, here, and them. they're going to spend the next year getting ready for the next one. And yeah. Teaching exactly. themselves the challenges that they need to uh, be successful. Yeah. yeah, I think we just need that variety, maybe a little bit, and maybe it's a couple of the the, the lower level classes are actually designed lower level, maybe or well, not lower level, but not you know not a World Cup level. It's you know maybe just a, a high national level, mm. um, right? It's got kind of balancing it like that a little bit. Whereas I think a lot of our courses this year they were all international level, um, right? Which, um, so. Yeah, it's thoughts right. and it's discussions. So I know. So interesting. So I have one more UKI open question, unless it's uh-huh. not the last. Last one, unless it's not the last one. Um, so do you, are you already thinking ahead to a time when um you like well, first I should say, are there limits on the who can I, I know that there's no limits on who can go to the US Open, but are there caps on the number that can go to the US Open right now? Yeah, that's that's what we don't want to do. If I'm, right. you know, we we really want the US Open to be open. So mm. if you've, you know, UKI competitors who are competing week out, they can get their buys so they can progress into further rounds, later rounds. Um, you know, so for example, the national final is three rounds, uh, round one, round two, and round three. Uh, if you win a cup, you go straight into the final. So you you bypass the first two rounds and. If you have a certain number of clear rounds each year, you can go into round two. But we want that, that anybody in the world can turn up and enter round one um, and run in that, in that event. So it doesn't matter what you've done previously, you can turn up, enter, and you can be in the competition. So that is a goal at this moment. You know, how, how big the event gets, I guess, if we keep growing, we need to start looking at more rings. I mean, now that we've gone six indoors, potentially if we grow again, way bigger we could go back to the two outdoors and go back to eight rings for five days you know it's um there's 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 scope at the the venue um you know personally i I love the venue it's a really easy venue to manage when they've got a great team on site so you you mentioned the tractors you know some of these venues if you don't have groundsmen that are immediately ready to drive a tractor when you need them to to get that arena ready and six minutes it, it can be an absolute nightmare and the guys at jacksonville are brilliant they sit waiting for half an hour before i want them in, in a tractor so the minute i i put my hand up they drive into the arena um and they get it ready and they're a brilliant team there so 
that's just one of the reasons it's 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 a venue that works really well because it's mm-hmm. got also a limited RV spots, not just maybe not all have power or facilities, but they will allow any number of RVs. So again, we're not restricted with that. And so many other events, they have X number of RVs and that's it. And that does control your number. Um which so um there's lots of benefits and there's lots of disadvantages with all venues, but yeah, long term we don't want to cap it whether we have to or whether we have to put some form of more qualification onto the lower rounds you know um mm. once you start getting to the size of a british event with 23 rings we won't be able to run it in the style that we like you know so um with, with the you know everyone being treated the same with strict running orders there's a certain size number of rings where that starts to become absolutely impossible to do so um right right yeah, it's yeah. kind of funny how um, how your perspective coming from from Europe, you're like, I mean, yeah, six rings is a lot, but you know, it's not yeah. twenty. You know, and we're yeah. like, we've never even we seen that. Yeah, we can't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, obviously we, we we run the opens differently. You know, the the, the twenty ring events in in Great Britain, um, you know, that it's all different classes. It's not strict running order. You know, it's an open course walk in the morning for everybody. You get an hour, and you just go to whatever ring you're in, and um, so it's it's a very I don't want to say unorganized, but it's a completely different organized way right. it's run. Whereas whereas we're strict running orders and everyone gets exactly the same course walking time, so it's completely fair. Um but everyone's in every event obviously, so it's it's a very different. Um so yeah, I hope I think we can probably go to we can run eight rings on this system quite easily. We've done that before. Um eight rings for five days is just a it's a long five days. Or so, yeah, I bet. You know, you know, yeah. it's more judges, more more ring crew, more everything you know more and more for four-legged flicks for example you know the more cameraman sure, he has sure. to get involved right. in, it's, it, everything grows and becomes more problematic once you start but um yeah but the, the short answer is we, we, we definitely want to well we possibly can is keep it an open event all right um, so we, excellent all right so back to the invitational okay. um so uh so is there so there's a set of competitors that are invited based on their performance at the West Open, the Open, and the Canadian Open? Is that a um, a set group? Like, can you go to the U.S. Open and then know after your run or you know after the end of the class, I just made it into the Invitational? Or mm-hmm. like, how 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 um, defined is the invitation process? Yeah, so the, the system we use this year is sort of got a little bit mathematical, but um, we basically decided that we'd have 450 dogs could win their way in so that you, you win your way by place. So what we did from 22, we added up all the number of dogs that were at the Canadian, the West Coast, and the US Open and worked out the percentage at each, each event okay. and then divided that 450 number by that percentage. So, for example, but from the Canadian Open, 70 dogs were going to get invited from the West Coast, it was 90. And from the US Open, which is much bigger, there was 290 dogs being invited. Oh. And then we picked four events from each of those, and we divided those spots between the heights and between those four events. So pretty much, um, uh, yeah, the, we announced before the event what you had to do to guarantee a spot at the Invitational. Um, so when you stood on the podium, you basically got the invitation letter. Um, so that was all, all sorted. So, yeah, everyone leaving the Open, um, eat, uh, any of the three Opens would have known Yes, I've definitely got a spot, or no, I haven't. And then, obviously, from that, we um, the thing that we opened up was a, um, a seeded lottery. So um, those that then didn't get the automatic place, everyone can apply to to come to the event. Um, and then you basically, from your results from the open, uh, you're in a certain group. So even people that got um, 100% eliminated, um, they would be in the bottom group. To so the people that were just outside the qualifying places that were in the in the top groups. Um, um, and then this year we've opened up a group which is I have no results so I didn't go to an open um, be it a young dog be it a dog that's been you know off injured um, be it just people you know life got in the way and they didn't make the open this year or one of the open so we've got that last group that is a um, I have no results but I'd like to come sort of thing so the, the idea is going to be that what we have found out which we kind of thought would happen but it's actually a bigger percentage is that out of the 450 spots where people could win on nearly half of those have been won by a double dog that makes sense so it's eight dogs won two spaces so we've got a huge a much bigger number going into the lottery than we we really anticipated um i thought about 
20 30 percent maybe would um get two spots but it's pretty much most dogs have got two spots so that's that's decreased the number of automatic win-ons um as in number of dogs but massively increased the lottery that we've got so um the lottery's still open we, we, we don't close for another few days but we've already got more dogs in that than we've got spaces for so we're still going to have to go to a lottery um and the idea is that you know we work our way down the groups until actually there's too many in that group the number of spaces we've got and that's where it becomes a lottery so if, so, if there's sorry so I, I, I was gonna rephrase that and tell tell me if i'm understanding you correctly so yeah. there you've got these uh groups uh, lottery groups based on um on placements at the big events uh and so that's like a b and c or whatever and so you'll yeah. take all if if you can accommodate all the a's you'll take all of them and Correct. then if you can only accommodate some of the b's then it'll be completely random among the yeah. b's so you won't Correct. get all the way down to the i have no re- results unless there's enough uh unless you have already taken all the a b c's d's and then you finally get down there right yeah, basically, we just keep, we, we keep taking the whole group until there's a point where actually there's more in this last group than we've got spots for. And at that point, it will just be a completely random draw from that pot of people. Oh, so yeah. so the, the, the idea is, the theoretical idea was that we would have all the best dogs. Right. So um, that, that, that's really the idea is that the best of the best are getting it running at this event. So... Um, and, and they proved it the for now i think probably because of the number of dogs that won double spaces there's a very good chance we're going to get down to dogs that may have not you know they haven't got results so there'll be some young dogs getting there which i which i think is quite nice in one way because you know there's certainly young dogs that might be you know two and a half by march but we're just two at the the open and you know we're, we're, we're too young really to compete at that level but that's six months time you know, you can see quite a big jump in, in, in dogs improvement in that time. So um, that could be quite nice to see. We, we get some nice young dogs coming through as well. Um, and that could be then an idea. We look at the future that is maybe we have a young dog lottery group that, you know, we take 30 young dogs that, you know, didn't manage to run an open, but are two and a half years old or whatever. And, 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 and they want their first exposure at a big international event like this. So um, those are all sorts of ideas for the future to look at um, and how the numbers work. Um, but I said, yeah, one, one thing we've definitely learned is that the, the good dogs win multiple spots. So mm-hmm. that, that's something for us to analyze and look at whether we want to keep it the same or whether we, we didn't do any roll down on win on. So if, if somebody won a spot, it didn't move down and they'd already got one. Mm-hmm. Um, just because we felt that would be a, a logistical nightmare to manage as well. Um, but um, that might be something we do have to look at, the roll down effect. Um, but the lottery should really and it sort does that, that out. Yeah. Yeah, so that that was our thought that we don't need to roll down because the lottery will roll them down because they'll be in the top group. The people that just missed out, they're in the top group anyway, so they're likely to get called in first. So, yeah, very um, interesting. Yeah, it's it's all you know, it's all a theoretical idea of a glass of wine in Italy, and then uh, um, right. how it sort of expands and how we can actually manage that. And and the idea we came up with, and you know, and who's to say that's the right way? We might find that actually next year. So we need to look at it a completely different way, but. Um, at, at this point, I think it's we are gonna it's gonna achieve what we were looking for, as in the number of dogs and also the best dogs that wanted to come will be there. So. And so this event, um, I was kind of reading between the lines on some stuff you said earlier about wanting it to be on turf. So I'm assuming that you just can't like you can't find an eight ring turf venue, right? So it, the the idea that you want it to be on turf is going to limit your venues and is going to limit your size, right? Yeah. So we've got a, um, it's in Canines, it's an indoor soccer, um, which gives us four nice size rings. So I think they're 150 by 100. So they're all really good size rings. Um, we, you know, we want this event to be international style, definitely. So, that, you know, the courses and uh, and everything about it. So obviously, we needed those size rings. We didn't want to go down to smaller rings. So yeah, uh, there's there's venues we we were looking at where there was potentially outdoor astroturf arenas as well. Being being quite blunt, some of them were just getting way outside of the agility price league. Once we started to look for eight ring astroturf, you know, mm-hmm. venues that are that size arena, you know, it's just it's just not happening for dog agility. Um, so yeah, we found this place. Um, 
I haven't personally been there, but we've had the guys go there for us and, and, and check it out and everything. And um, But it looks beautiful, so um, I'm excited for it. But yeah, that's why we've had the limit to 600 dogs. Um, and that's right. also something we're going to learn this year. Is 600 the right number? Can we get in more? Can we get in less? Um, so with everybody does every run. So, um, you know, it's each each ring has to, or each class has to do 600 runs. So, you know, it's managing that in a day, basically. Um, so you class run in a day. So um, I, I think possibly we can expand in the future, maybe make it a little bit bigger. My brain tells me from my other events that we can probably run more than 600. But um, we, I, I just want this year just to make sure that, you know, we actually can. So we've we played a little bit safe by going 600. Right. All right. Maybe the last question here. We'll see. Right. Um, and that is, um, so will you be sure to announce? So I know that you said there's a massive learning that you're going to have, have happen when you actually run your first event. Um, but will you figure out what changes you want to make before the first of the three opens so that I people absolutely. know? Yeah. 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 My, um, anyone that knows me knows that next year's US Open is almost planned. We, we, we pretty much do it fresh so that everything's fresh in our brain. And um, once we finish, because otherwise you roll on to the next event that we run. Um, and my, my next event, I've got two or three big ones in February, March early. So um, the US Open, we wanted to brain dump now, put all the ideas together. Um, and that's what we'll do after that one. It'll be probably by the start of May before WO starts, we'll have decided how um, the one TDC will work next year, the invitation next year. So um, yeah, um, I mean, already we're looking at the numbers of, of, of who's applied and who won double spots and where they won those double spots. So we've already started that analysis. But yeah, most definitely before they enter the Canadian Open, the rules for next year's invitation will be out so that everybody knows where they stand. Um, and, you know, it would definitely be the results in those three Opens anyway. Um, and Cups and Classics, we, we've actually, the winners of the Cups and the Classics have actually got into a group, a seeded group as well. So that we'll keep the same events definitely for the following year so that everybody knows they need to target those events. But yes, the numbers we take from those events might vary. But again, they'll definitely know before we um before entries open for those opens. Right. So that everyone is fair for everybody to know what they're getting involved in. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm excited about how much we got to go into both events, the US Open and the Invitational. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on there and uh, we're looking forward to seeing how this all shakes out um in uh the spring for the invitational so thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me thanks for, for um, questions good questions and hopefully you know pick people's interest in, in what they're doing so even if they don't come along this year they, they get to watch it on four-legged flicks and um and you can see what we're doing and um and also, you know, just, you know, those that are coming along, you know, we always welcome your feedback on the event. So especially on a, on a brand new event, you know, we will be wanting people to feedback to us what they thought um, on the process of getting there, but also the, uh, the event itself. So, All right. Perfect. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hitaboard.com. Happy training. Thank you for listening to Bad Dog Agility. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information, updates, and links to all our socials, just check out our website, www.baddogagility.com. If you haven't already signed up for our email subscription, we would love to have you join the BDA community. Until next time, take care.